Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today, um, either this morning or this afternoon. Today we're going to begin our Play to Zero, I'm, I'm sorry, Playbook webinar series. We're joined by three of our contributors to the latest playbook, Building for the Next Generation. If you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to put them in the chat and stick around for the Q&A at the very end. The QR code on the screen will lead you to our, web, our YouTube page uh, where you can find previous webinars or many of the videos that were at our summits. So most of you in attendance, um, you already know the Green Sports Alliance pretty well, but for those of you who are new, we are a 501c6 nonprofit membership-based organization. We exist because of your support, uh, and together we leverage the power of sport to drive meaningful impact. We do this by conveying industry stakeholders and engaging fans, athletes, and communities to embrace sustainability. If you and your organization are interested in membership, please contact myself and we will set up a meeting with the rest of our team. And Michael, who's our co-host, uh, Green Sports Alliance uh, employee as well, will be putting some information in the chat throughout um, this presentation. And we wanna give a big shout out to our members. Um, I saw a few of you join in. We have some of our board members, Jason Twill being one of them, one of our speakers. Uh, we have some of our Play to Zero partners, RWDI, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, even some of our international folks are here, uh, our next door neighbors from Mexico. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's because of you all that we're able to achieve our mission and keep moving the needle in the sustainable sports. So the reason why we're all here is to talk about the Building for the Next Generation playbook. And if you scan the QR code, you can get it right to your phones, um, or Michael will post in the chat. You can just go to greensportsalliance.com slash playbooks and get it downloaded to your laptop. And I'll pass it over to Michael Krause. If you don't already know him, he's the director of events and analytics at the Green Sports Alliance. Uh, he's the connector, mediator, and the mastermind behind this playbook. So go ahead, Michael. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Hello to everybody. This is Michael Krause. I'm the Director of Sustainable Events and Analytics for the Green Sports Alliance. I am trying to put some things in the chat, but uh, I'm proving not as good as I thought I would be at it. Uh, trying to put those there now. You should be able to click the link in the chat now to lead you to that playbook. Um, but before I go into this playbook specifically, we do about one to two playbooks a year. We've done 14 to 15 of them since uh, we started the Green Sports Alliance um, almost 14, 15 years ago. Um, they're a huge part of what it is uh, that we offer at the Green Sports Alliance. They're industry experts coming together to put together a resource to elevate a topic. And last year we decided uh, that we really needed a resource, uh, especially with the boom of stadiums and remodels, um, to talk about how to build uh, green buildings, green arenas and stadiums. And so, um, I mean, you can see the partners on that slide. You may have to lean in a little bit, um, but uh, we had industry experts come together for this Building for the Next Generation playbook. Uh, it's a very powerful playbook. Uh, it's about 49, 50 pages with case studies at the end. And, and Katie, will you actually go to the next slide? Um, can you... Um, so there was, uh, behind it too, there was this uh, advisory board. So I also want to give a shout out and a thank you to our advisory board. These are the folks that took the content and made sure it was the highest quality it could possibly be. The point of this uh, playbook was to get this in the hands of decision makers, to get this in the hands of folks who are planning two years out, 10 years out before their stadiums, arenas, or anything are rebuilt and remade. And then go one more slide, Katie. Um, this uh, playbook has, I think, some very uh, important aspects in it. Uh, one, if you can see on the far left, we mapped out the standards and framework certifications that are most popular in the playbook. If you go to the playbook, it's page seven, page eight, something like that. Uh, and I encourage you to look there. Um, a lot of folks ask us, where do we start? 
How do we understand what is green building? Where do we begin? And we're going to talk about that on this webinar today. But those certification standards can be used as frameworks. And so open those up to help you understand how other folks are thinking about it. The playbook itself was organized by five key fundamentals. Uh, so you can, once again, they're tiny, but you can see them there. Uh, one, green venues are good investments. We talked, we leaned into the topic of money. Um, two, commit early to excellence, which is where uh, you're going to hear Jason talk about today. Three, ensure maximum benefit to communities. So these stadiums don't live on an island, that they're a part of the DNA of the community. Four, build for our future, which is kind of the technical piece of the document where we talk about electrification, renewable energy, water. Uh, we talk about uh, health and safety. And then the last one, uh, which is a fundamental five, measure, adapt, and monitor. Uh, you're going to hear Meredith with Aptum talk about today. And that is really you have the stadium up and how do we keep that functioning at a high level? So those are what we're going to dive in today. Uh, and I'll pass it back to you, Katie, to introduce our panelists and then to dive into our topics. My my microphone is <laughs> now we can okay. hear you. I can I can jump in uh, with some introductions. I don't have your bios up right this moment, um, but we have three presenters today. We've got Jason Twill with Veritas Initiative, who's going to kick us off. Um, and Jason, I might pass it to you for your own introductions. I don't have your bio pulled up. Brian Antonin Antonson right. with McKinsey. Okay, yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thanks, okay. Katie. All right, I'll do the intros. Uh, sorry about that, tech issues. Uh, Jason Twill is a lead fellow and a principal, and the principal and national practice lead with Veritas Initiative, with a career spanning more than 24 years in climate change education, sustainability, and urban regeneration. Jason has been at the forefront of social, ecological, and economical transformation. A globally recognized pioneer in regenerative development and design, Jason's work is advancing next generation solutions to reverse global warming and restore planetary health. His career experience includes managing and planning award-winning urban regenerative projects throughout North America, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East, serving as a world change advisor to Paul G. Allen and heading sustainability and innovation for Lendlease Australia. More recently, Jason has served as an advisor to multiple local and national governments on climate action, urban transformation, and social equity strategies, including creation of a 10-year national legacy framework for Qatar, drawing the country's investment in hosting the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Uh, next is Brian. Brian Antonson is the Senior Vice President of McKinstry. He's helped shape city skylines across the country, leading complex construction projects for major institutions over his 20-year career. In his role, he takes an active role in empowering clients to achieve their core missions through effective and sustainable construction projects. Notable projects include helping the University of Washington to build resilience and decarbonize its central energy systems, leading King County Metro in electrifying its public transit fleet, and working side by side with major sports leagues in their drive to zero carbon, in their drive to zero carbon. <laughs> Brian also was instrumental in delivering one of the first zero carbon energy districts in the country. And next we have Meredith McCurdy. Meredith leads Aptum's Sustainable Sport Index survey and benchmarking report with a background in sports marketing, sponsorship, and global events. Meredith has a special interest in helping build the business case for sustainability in sport. Meredith brings expertise, I'm sorry, experience in sports marketing, sponsorship, and global events, working with brands and their sponsorships in domestic and global sport, including the Olympic Games, FIFA World Cup, F1, NFL, NBA, NHL, and MLS. 
She joined the environmental and sustainability solutions firm Aptum to lead the sustainable sport index survey and benchmarking report and brings a special interest in helping make the business case for sustainability in sport. And now I'll pass it to Jason um, with Virtus. Thanks, Katie, and thanks, Michael. Um, that was a long, those are long bios. I gotta do short bios next time. Um, I think what's really good to know is you listed a couple of things in that introduction, Michael. Um, so I, I've been in the sustainable built environment space for about 25 years. I kind of saw the maturity of the topic in relative to design, engineering, and building green buildings and sustainable infrastructure projects um, for about 25 years. And, and if you anthropomorphize the movement, we like to say that we were kids in the early 2000s, late 90s. The 2010s were more like we were a rambunctious teenager still trying to figure out what we're going to be when we grow up. And now we're in the 2020s. And you've seen the language change from green to sustainable to restorative. And you hear the word regenerative quite a bit now in the world. And net zero is at the top levels of government on a drive to net zero. And that's one that we've adopted the Green Sports Alliance and I played a zero framework. Um, so there's been a maturity. We're still, we're like young adults getting our first job, um, but we still have a long way to go. So this journey slide we've used for the better part of 20 years. And I know some of my friends on the call will know where this comes from. And I give credit to one of my teachers and mentors, Bill Reed and Regenesis Group that really pioneered, really advancing us beyond green towards this, you know, much deeper advanced thinking on sustainability. But if you look at this trajectory of ecological design, we've called, we've used it as a compass to measure the industry's effectiveness at delivering ever greater, higher performing buildings and infrastructure. So if you go from kind of left to right, you know, can, anything left of conventional is basically not code compliance, so therefore against the law. And you've seen the early phase of the sustainability, I said modern sustainability built environment movement from like the mid 90s till about the 2010s. You saw a Herculean transformation in educating design firms, architects, engineers, builders, policy people, cities adopting green building ordinances, and just the capabilities exponentially increase in our you know effectiveness of driving lead certified or other buildings so green would be kind of very much that lead space there's a lot of great consultants on here now um, that do this very well they're safe hands to work with and now we're kind of going from i'm still on that slide katie um, we're still going from kind of um, green to sustainable which is that vertical access point where you have a neutral impact on society and the environment so that's now where we're getting to, but we still keep this more restorative and regenerative on the horizon, regenerative being the kind of penultimate form of sustainability. And the simplest way to define it is life creating conditions conducive to life. Um, I also learned that from another great mentor, Janine Benyus, who's fantastic. What's important to recognize is that probably for the better part of 15 years now, once the design, engineering, construction industries really adopted the capabilities to deliver lead or advanced sustainable buildings cost effectively. It really left being a design and technical challenge. Um, getting to net zero and beyond, you HOK, populist, safe hands like Mortensen Construction, um other people ecoworks you saw the the, the uh, advisors that were on our committee doing this playbook all can do this stuff right it's not super difficult to design and deliver a net zero stadium or arena climate pledge just proved that with an ad adaptive reuse of an old venue in seattle what's missing is the process and leadership and setting up a project from the front end <laughs> and setting in tone, a pro establishing a project up front to be able to ensure that outcome of net zero in the most cost-effective, financially environmental, viable manner possible. And that's what we kind of led to rechanging our approach to the playbook, knowing that the design, engineering, and builders out there can do this. How do you really set a project up and drive and manage that, you know, 
diverse team of experts to deliver the outcomes that we're seeking. Um, so that really starts with setting up a proper owner's vision and an owner's project requirement. So I've had to do a lot of net zero projects around the world in different countries, living buildings, which are even harder to do. As anyone who's been on this, uh, been on that journey doing living building, it changes your entire mental model of how you think of yourself as a built environment practitioner. It'd be great to see a living stadium someday or an arena, but like that's, that's on the horizon for someone to take up the challenge beyond climate pledge. Um, but getting an owner's project vision and owner requirements set up front is crucial. Um, a lot of times to make it, so I've been at the inflection point of the investor developer for 25 years. So I've had to prove the economics of doing advanced buildings like a living building or a net zero building. And I can, you cannot do it economically viably or I guess underpin the business case and financial viability without having an owner's project requirement document. We prepared one. So Brian Antonson and I know this well, I've worked with him as a client and now as a colleague. We've been on this journey for 20 years trying to figure out the economics of delivering these assets. Um, and as a point in Seattle, we were delivering lead platinum buildings for cheaper than my colleagues were delivering lead gold. So there's a process evolution that's super critical to know. Um, I know Gensler gets this. I know the design teams that you know partner with the yeah. Alliance get this stuff. But I, even as representing an owner delivering a high performing net zero asset, I would hire a commissioning agent or a performance engineer, I would call, to help articulate the owner's requirements very granularly, not just saying I want to be net zero or I want to be lead platinum because that's very broad and it'll cost you money. <laughs> but having a very detailed under, understanding of how you're procuring engineering services, procuring architectural services and building services with very specific outcomes of the structure, the envelope performance, what relation of renewable supply energy you want or demand reduction within the building, lighting, having a lot more specificity. So when you go out and get a team in place to deliver that asset, you're buying that performance up front, which de-risks the cost exposure as you go down a design frame. So getting an owner's project requirement in place, which is a living document, I would start with that document first, and then I would hire a design, engineering, and construction team to deliver that once that vision is set, for, set forth and those requirements are at least to a point where you have a lot more clarity on what exactly, what type of venue you really want to have. Um, a lot of the firms that partner with the Alliance know this process. It's getting owners to really evolve it. Once you have, what's, what's a major piece of that, I mentioned process earlier. Once you have an OPR document in place, which is like a living document that will evolve throughout the origin of a project, the design phase, construction, and post-occupancy operational phase, it should be throughout the entire document. Um, what's critical is that it sits within this integrated process. And this is how you reduce cost and risk. By front-loading the design, once you have an OPR document, you bring on the experts that you need to deliver a high-performing net zero venue or arena. Um, and you use this process to drive better decision-making up front and compress the first cost down. And that means identifying all third-party funding, design pathways, construction pathways, structural design, everything so that an owner or owner's rep can make much more informed decisions earlier to reduce cost exposure later in a design phase and during construction. That is the only way I've been able to do cost effective net zero buildings. And I know my colleagues on the call will back me on that. There is in many types of assets, including stadiums, which are, as we know, the evolution of the, of the sector is really going at sports and entertainment districts now. So these are vibrant, mixed use, 24 seven place outcomes. So the business model for sports entertainment's evolved now to much more complex and higher, like larger scale projects to the tunes of many billions of dollars. It's a lot of money, which also means there's a lot of opportunity to achieve these outcomes cost effectively. This is, there is a, a known investment barrier. There's a point when you're looking at an investment model with the financers of these projects 
where there's a, a point in the, in the investment model where there's no further justification to spend money on sustainability outcomes because your, your costs are higher than the asset value, so the underwriting of the asset. Um, we specialize, and you're seeing the evolution of third-party venture capital and equity to help overcome that and alleviate the infrastructure and electrification and net zero outcomes. And this is kind of the evolution of, I guess, when we did like Lumen Field for the owners of the Seahawks about 15 year, 13 years ago, we used third-party funding from the federal government. Then it was the Jobs Act to offset and defray first cost for large-scale solar PV array, lighting, water efficiencies, and we retrofitted the venue to what was then kind of leading edge sustainability. The, the industry, the government incentives and grants have all evolved and the financial architecture of how you do these projects has evolved to a point where it really can overcome those investment barriers. Now you have the Inflation Reduction Act funding. So marrying up federal funding against renewable supply and infrastructure to help achieve these full electrified venues, zero energy venues um, is more achievable than it ever has been in the past. But having the upfront understanding of how to structure the financing and capital strategy for a venue, a new venue, or even retrofitting an existing venue that might be 20 plus years old, you now have a lot less capital constraints to achieve this. So having the right partners at your side to help manage the financialization of net zero is also becoming more critical than ever to help owners understand the business case for this. Um, I'm gonna shift probably over to Brian at this point um, who really takes the safe hands. And I've worked with Brian on everything I just shared about. Brian's been on projects with me. So we've worked very collaboratively in this process. So Brian, why don't you kind of take it to the next level? Yeah, spot on, Jason. Thank you so much for that that overview. You know, let's let's maybe step back and think about how, as an industry, how are we doing delivering uh, these, these projects, project execution, um, and, and the importance of the plan. But by the number, you know, 98% of projects are taking 20% longer to finish and 80% more budget than expected. That's per a, a, a landmark McKinsey report. Like these, these projects are hard, right? There's, there's curveballs that are thrown at you every day. And uh, for all those that have been on both a successful project and maybe a project that fits within these numbers, it really, uh, you know, is cornerstone on the foundation of a great plan. And so if you fail to prepare, you're gonna to prepare to fail. And these are just, this is like our entire industry, all project types, you know, and think about all the challenges that we have, you know, it's like, okay, let's say we've got a new stadium. What's the most, what's the biggest priorities? It's like, where's the funding, government affairs, entitlement, departures, fan experience. Those are like the, the first things and they're, and they're super hot and you gotta jump on them and you're running. And, you know, a lot of times um, if you're going to add sustainability, decarbonization, you know, and, and play into zero on top of that, you're, you're adding more complexity. So what do we need? We need a plan to pull off these projects of exactly what Jason was talking about. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to walk through. A, I, I think plans sometimes can be overcomplicated. I think plans, the simplest plans are the best plans out there. And. Uh, you know, this is really um, if you if you've got your uh, your playbook, you know, and, and you've got it out here. Fundamental number two, committing early to excellence. OK, this is this is some of the cornerstone of planning fundamental two, And you, you can see the process on here, but I'm, I'm just going to walk you through an example of a project and how easy it is to think through a plan to drive sustainability into your project. So discovery phase, what are we trying to do? We're trying to understand existing conditions, outcomes, and goals. So let's 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 take a project. Let's take any event center uh, in the nation that's existing. We'll pick an existing building example here. And so it's like, okay, we you know got a bunch of uh, you, you know carbon sourced from our HVAC heating units, which are all gas-fired units, um, you know, serving all of our areas. And boy, they're at the end of their life and um, you know, the outcomes we're hearing our, our, our fans and stakeholders want us to deliver greener facilities. Our, our, um, our 
folks that are booking, you know, coming to the venues, bringing their tours, they're demanding greener facilities. So, okay, that's phase one. We've got gas fired heating units, our stakeholders there. We've set some goals. We're trying to decarbonize our facility. Okay, phase two, analysis. What do you do with it? Okay, well, what are the options? Business as usual, put some new gas fired units in. Okay, got it. You've got code complications, refrigerant trash, whatever challenges that you'll have, carbon taxes. Okay, what's my other options? Well, I can go and electrify the units, but now, shoot, now I've got to upsize my electrical service uh, that was originally installed. That's a bunch of cost. Or, hey, what if, uh, what if I leverage a, you know, a, a, a district energy system, or we like to call eco districts, to, you know, serve off of geothermal um, sources or others and, Oh, by the way, somebody else will bring that to me for service of my new units. Okay, so now phase two is done. We've got an analysis. We've got a bunch of different options. Now you go to phase three, synthesis. Okay, all right. This one's, you know, choose by advantages or whatever method you get to find the right solution and then drive an actionable plan to implement those components. Cornerstone planning doesn't have to be that, that challenging. That's just an insight of a, of a simple process of how you pull off a plan. So what is a, what, what, how do you execute a plan? You, you need a great team, right? And, you know, when you, when you look at a team, you, you got to get the right team and you got to engage them at the right time. Uh, you know, so this is just some examples of key folks that you want you know, as part in, you know, helping you in that OPR phase that Jason was talking about in that, in that planning phase, putting your plan together. Don't wait too long to bring these key partners up. Uh, if you can onboard them simultaneously, develop and learn together. Um, and, you know, we love this approach uh, called the big room approach. I'm sure many on here are very familiar with big room, but getting all of your stakeholders in the room to drive key project decisions. And what, what I love about that is, is there's just so much opportunity when you get some more minds thinking about uh, the, the challenges they're at. And you know, I, I get frustrated. I, I can't remember how many times we've been onboarded late to a project as the MEP engineer. And we got a really good idea. And they're like, oh, shoot, we, we should have thought about that six months ago. It's too late now. And so there's all these great ideas that that sometimes don't surface to the top when when you don't have those key folks out there. Actually, the one of the best ideas I ever heard was uh, from like the drywall contractor came up with this like super innovative approach to build some complex space. And traditionally, they wouldn't even be in the room. We were running the big room approach. They were part of that planning process. And you know, it's like, oh, hey, this might be a dumb idea, but those great ideas can come from anywhere. Get the right team on board early uh, and truly collaborate uh, as much as you can. Jason, you want to talk uh, about some of the out, outcomes those those that plan can get us? You, you said favorite story. One of my favorite stories is a, a school in Pennsylvania where the design team figured out just by changing the color of the paint on the wall, on the back of a paint chip, you have what's called a light reflectance value. And they realized if you got that up to 70%, the natural light coming in the windows would reflect off the paint on the wall and push back in the room to reduce the amount of artificial lighting required. And when you reduce the artificial lighting, you reduce the heat load in the rooms. And by doing that, you're reducing the mechanical systems required to condition the space. So just by changing the paint color on the wall, which costs nothing, that saved the project about seven hundred thousand dollars. That's okay. integrated design and approaching system snaking on a building. So managing okay. that process. I mean, what I said is, it's not been a technology or design problem for many years. It's usually a project governance and process problem. And if you get that figured out, you can achieve these outcomes. And there's many projects around the world that approve that. What's important for a lot of owners and venue operators. Right now, they're dealing with it in real time in cities like New York and Seattle, where the codes have really advanced. So I mentioned the evolution and maturity of sustainability in the United States. It's it's now becoming law to be fully electric or decouple yourself from fossil fuel related energy generation like natural gas. 
for larger complex venues like stadiums, arenas, they more often have um, event entertainment spaces adjacent to them. It's not super easy. So the, it, there's a risk of not doing this in a stageable, cost-effective way, either for new venues that can do it right off the bat or retrofitting existing arenas and venues. Um, more and more often, you know, passive design, taking advantage of kind of passive energy strategies like wind and solar, capturing water, really looking at electrification and strategically the amount of power supplied to a venue and reducing the amount of feeds because it's super cost costly to get utilities to increase feeds by venues. We're dealing with that on some clients right now. Um, induction cooktops and educating concessionaires like Levy and others on, you know, really the changing nature of kitchen electrification and obviously lighting. Um, you've seen, we've seen the kind of birth of LED stadium lighting going back 10 years to Safeco and the Yankees. And now you're seeing more and more, um, LED lighting is really changing the nature of reducing energy loads there. And then obviously you know, Lincoln, we mentioned Lincoln, you know, Financial Center and the Eagle Stadium, you know, they have a huge partnership with the Renewable Energy Partner. Um, clean supply of renewable energy on site and some instances off site with virtual power plants. You're seeing a massive transformation happening around the sector. That's super important for venues to be cognizant of as codes change, as new laws come into effect, it's going to cost you on the amount of carbon emissions. Um, local law 97 being one that's coming, but it's, there's more coming. So it's going to be costly not to take action and address a net zero strategy for your venue. What's crucial around all of that and making timely and effective decisions on these changes is data and benchmarking. And that's where Aptim has been a real leader in helping out the sector understand, you know, baselining and benchmarking, which is crucial on, you know, foundational to what we're trying to do in the sector. So I'm going to hand over to Meredith at Aptim now to kind of talk through that with the work that they've been doing. Thanks so much. So, yeah, like like Jason spoke about, you know, in building for the future, you know, once your state of the art venue is built and opens its doors, the journey is really just beginning. And this is where we start to talk about that tracking, measurement, benchmarking. And the technology and operations of sustainability are, are continuing to grow and evolve. Um, and so what is new can quickly become old, but also what is new if not working correctly may not produce the efficiencies that you'd plan for. Um, so looking at proper commissioning and tracking to identify any types of maintenance issues. Um, those operational issues may be money saving, um, but also about attracting revenue. You know, Jason and Brian also talked about the entertainment and the, the riders that um, are being developed by tours to, to attract or to go to um, sustainable venues. Um, attracting sponsors um, and publicly traded companies are likely to be soon required to disclose um, elements of ESG reporting um, and will want to align themselves with, with properties that share those values and, and provide storytelling opportunities. Um, and as the journey continues, you know, this, we talk about kind of two things in life are, are for certain death and taxes. And I'm going to add one more to that, um, where the future of climate related regulation, compliance and transparent public reporting is, is certain. Um, and that's going to require uh, building and tracking. So we can go to the next slide, Katie, and talk a little bit more about what what does that tracking lifestyle life cycle look like? Um, so in the next slide, we talk about commissioning. There we go, commissioning your building. Um, and then starting to, to track all of these different operational um, key performance indicators. So the basics tend to be things like energy, water, waste, and your diversion, um, the broader look at, at greenhouse gas emissions, um, scopes one and two are the easiest to start with. But don't forget some of these other kind of um, less common or less talked about um, KPIs like air quality, or um, what's the percentage of green cleaning products being used in your venue? Uh, what percentage of food and beverage is being procured uh, locally? And then also starting to build and build on that supply chain and look at your scope three emissions. So you've got all these tracking, all these numbers, so you need to evaluate and benchmark. And we'll talk a little bit about benchmarking in a second. Um, and from that, establishing goals, making a plan for how you're going to achieve them, 
hopefully executing upon that. But then in order to see if that worked, you got to go back to the top, right? And look at, at tracking measurement and, and the new baseline. So we can go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about benchmarking. Um, so Aptum is an environmental services firm, and this is our third year of publishing um, the Sustainable Sport Index, or SSI. It is a thought leadership piece that's grounded in a survey that collects self-reported data from venues um, where we analyze and aggregate the data, and then we publish an anonymized benchmarking report um, that's available to the public at no cost. Um, there's no rankings, no awards, no certifications. It's just data and a bit of a state of the industry. And that's intentional to try to encourage venues at all stages of sustainability to participate so we get a more robust data set so in return too for venues helping to share their data and contribute to this this analysis each venue also receives a custom and confidential report that uh, maps their responses to the aggregate and hopefully provides some immediate um, actionable next steps as well um, and participation and reports are all at no cost. Um, it's part of uh, Aptum's own ESG efforts to kind of provide some thought leadership, data, information to the industry. Um, so we are super pumped this year. This is our third year. We had significant growth in participation. So now about one in four venues participate. Um, that's across kind of the seven leading um, US, North America-based um, leagues uh, and we had 96 percent retention so we feel like we're demonstrating year over year the value uh, that we provide to participating venues so now we can dig into the data a little bit on the next slide um, so some of these fun facts on this slide are not actually in our public report i went back into the data to look a little bit at um, the newest venues that participated in ssi to pull out some some more unique facts since we're talking to an audience here about about future venues so new is not always industry leading um so 20% of ssi's responding venues this year opened in the last eight years Half of those are LEED certified, which is one of the green building um, certifications of the built environment. I'm not talking about operations right now. But if you look at some other fun facts, 25% of those new venues don't have a sustainability position on staff, which to me kind of indicates that sustainability is not necessarily integrated top to bottom throughout the operations of their facility. Um, only one of those new venues produces on-site renewable energy and only one of those new venues is tracking greenhouse gas emissions at any scope level so new is not always industry leading right it's more than just everything you kind of put into that initial um, built environment the other thing looking overall at all of our participants certifications aren't everything we do think you know certifications are a great way to um, map your built environment or your operations to um, sustainability standards. So it's a great way to measure things. It's a great way to establish that you've wanted to do something a, a certain way. However, they're not perfect in the way that they measure or include certain practices. Um, and so over half of all of the SSI venues have some type of sustainability certification for either the built environment, their operations, well, et cetera. Um, but only a third, again, are tracking any greenhouse gas emissions, right? So kind of taking it to that next step of this all-encompassing um, effect and footprint. And of those venues with uh, certifications, um, still half are using single-use plastic at concessions. So there's parts of these certifications that don't address the whole, um, and there's still kind of work to be done. We can check out the next slide, Katie. So I'm here to also invite you um, and your venues to participate in um, SSI. So just some other fun facts that we pull out that can be helpful in also helping you build the business case for sustainability. Um, so 64% of venues are reporting that sponsorship has in, so sponsorship revenue has increased as a result of sustainability programs, which is super awesome. I partially tie that to this 96% of S&P 500 companies that are voluntarily publishing ESG reports. They want that storytelling. They want to align with properties that, um, that share their values. 
but we've also got some other work to do, right? So 8% of venues um, produce a public sustainability or ESG report. So as we look at some of that future potential regulation, compliance and reporting, that's something we should move forward with. Um, when we talk about greenwashing, things like that, the more transparent, the more we talk about what we do, I think the more we battle that. Um, and then, you know, as we're looking at, at the built environment and the newest, most innovative building, um, we're also looking at how how is our climate and our environment going to change? So only 7% of venues have developed any type of climate adaptation plan that would consider a variety of, of climate related either disasters or, or changes, um, heat, uh, flooding, wildfire, these other types of, of potential dangers. So, you know, help us establish these benchmarks. Help us go deeper than what I've shared with you today. You know, we talk about per cap revenue when we would love to someday talk about, you know, per caps on, on energy, on GHG emissions, waste, water, and more. We're not quite there yet. So help us track this data, help us share this data with one another and collaborate. Um, SSI is an annual survey um, and we will open up in um, probably about late May of next year. And in the meantime, download SSI now and check out kind of where we are in the space together. So that's it from me. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Brian. A um, little housekeeping here. What we're going to do is we're going to transition, talk about a couple of upcoming events, things on the Green Sports Alliance side, so you guys are informed. Then we're going to transition right back to a QA. and a um, so, there is a there's a chat tab and there's a questions tab. If you have, uh, you can use either one. Doesn't matter. We'll see them. Uh, but please submit your questions there right now. And we'll be sharing those in just a second. And we'll take the last maybe 10 minutes or so to do this. Um, like I mentioned, this topic came from a playbook. Um, and the playbook last year, uh, we had two of them. We had water, one on water and one on green building. I encourage you guys to go check those out. Again, check the chat to see those resources. And the next year, we have two more playbooks coming out, uh, one on reuse and one on energy. Uh, this is a slide just on the, play, on the reuse one, but I want to put this out there because we are gathering information on these. We are looking for partners for case studies across reuse and energy. And so I encourage you guys to please engage with those, reach out to us, and I can put a couple emails in the chat here. Uh, if you're interested in those topics or this one, uh, we would love to chat. Um, we want to continue to elevate these topics to the sports and entertainment uh, industry and these venues. So leadership comes within this uh, within this group here. Um, the emails are in the chat. If you have any interest, please reach out to us. And we have a couple upcoming events as well. Um, and Katie, I can push that back to you to talk about some of the other webinars and opportunities in our pipeline real quick. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so a few upcoming events before we strike the new year. Uh, Bradley Vogel, many of you know and love him, and Michael Kraus, is sitting right in front of you, are joined with RWDI discussing how to elevate sustainability in sports and entertainment venues. And in December, we the GSA is joined with BSI, SoFi Stadium, um, Edgbaston Stadium and Honeycomb Strategies in a case study on how the venues got certifications and continue their certification process throughout the year. The registration links we'll send in the chat. Um, if you're a member of ours and have a case study or uh, a recent innovation that you think that others would benefit from sharing, uh, please contact Michael or myself or Matt Adler uh, on the GSA team and we'll, uh, we'll get you on the calendar. And now we'll hop into the Q&A. Um, so we have some, some questions that some of you 